Hey everybody, welcome to Wex Video Live. My name's Neil from Nikon School. I'm joined here by my colleague Rishi Shearer from uh, hey. Nikon School as well. You might also know Rishi from his YouTube channel, Rishi Talks. Uh, we're here today to talk to you about the Z9. We've got about an hour to go through. Uh, we've got a presentation and we've got a Q&A afterwards, but put the questions into the chat, talk to us. Uh, between myself and Rishi, there's very little we can't answer about uh, Nikon cameras, lenses, speed lights. We're talking Z9 today, so fantastic camera. We've had, been lucky enough for the last three months to have a chance to play with prototypes. We're also going to be talking about some of the new lenses, the 100-400, which is superb, 24-120 f4, which is great as well, and we'll perhaps mention the FTZ2 adapter. So we've got lots to cover. Keep the questions coming in. Um, don't forget there are Wex Black Friday deals as well, not available on the Z9 uh, because it's all pre-ordered out, and if you want a Z9, get your pre-order in now because we've had tons and tons of orders about it. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague Rishi. Um, he's going to take you through a presentation on this and then we will start answering your questions. Uh, over to you, Rishi. Cool. Thank you, Neil. Um, hey, everybody. Um, so we're going to run through some main specifications. Um, but the key thing about today is that this being a QA and a is that if you want to get, obviously, our knowledge, our hands-on knowledge of shooting with Z9 over the past couple of months, then please do ask any questions that you have and I can pick those up. Um, I'm more than happy to um, spend the vast majority of this time just answering your questions. Um, as Neil mentioned, if, if I can't answer it, maybe he can and if he can't, there's not many people who can. So um, there's generally most things can get answered in here. So we'll start off with just by a couple of slides whilst I wait for some questions to come in. Um, and then once we once we get some questions going, we'll jump over to those. So let me just share my screen here, first of all. Now, I don't want to spend um, too much time on main specifications because I feel like you've all going to have seen these by now. You're all going to be well aware about what the main specifications are. But just as a quick um, refresher to some people or to those of you that might not have seen all of them, um, the key kind of headline specs are that this is a new sensor for Nikon. Um, it's a stacked sensor and it's also a um, backlit CMOS sensor as well. So there's a lot of technology that's going on in this sensor. Its megapixel count is 45 megapixels, which might sound like it's similar to the 45 megapixel sensor that we've seen before in the D850, the Z7, the Z7 II, but it's not the same because of that stack technology. It does mean that it's a much faster sensor, you can get much faster readouts, and that then goes hand in hand with the new processor. So in our previous cameras, D6 used XSpeed 6, um, Z7 and Z7 II and Z6 and Z6 II used XSpeed 6 processors that obviously Z6 II and Z7 II used dual XSpeed 6 processors. Um, this is the first camera that will use our XSpeed 7 processor and obviously that will be the processor for our cameras going forward. Um, but it's the fastest processor Nikon's ever made. Um, it's currently around about 10 times faster than XSpeed 6 processors. Um, and 10 times faster than previous cameras. So it's incredibly quick. And that's what's going to be making the, the Z9 as fast as it can be, along with that faster stacked sensor as well. This is also the first Nikon camera that can shoot 8K. Um, and it's not just, you know, a short period of time of recording. There are literally, you are able to record for up to hours of 8K video. Um, and it's as good of a stills camera as it is a, a video camera. So it's not like it's stills and then a little bit of video. It's good, very good at both. It's very good at stills photography, very good at video as well. Um, it is Nikon's most advanced autofocusing system. I've got a couple of other slides that will dive into um, some of the detail around autofocusing systems as well, um, but it is the best focusing system that, that Nikon have ever made. Um, we're comparing this directly to D5, D6, D850. If you're a DSLR user, um, this is kind of a lot more advanced than you would find on DSLRs. Now, one of the reasons that this is kind of the camera that kind of ticks every box for almost everybody is a couple of things that in the past we haven't been able to do, which is, first of all, AF calculations, being able to calculate a faster autofocus or to be able to track and follow a subject over a faster frame rate. So don't confuse this with um, the ability to shoot at 120 frames per second. Even if you were using a Z9 at 
10 frames a second or 20 frames per second, you would still be able to calculate autofocus at 120 frames per second. So the autofocus is always calculating at that incredibly fast speed, despite what you might be shooting at. You can also obviously shoot at 120 frames per second if you wanted to. There is um, absolutely no EVF blackout at all. Um, and to kind of go hand in hand with that, there isn't any drop in the EVF. There's no blackout. There's no loss of that current view. Um, this is the closest EVF you can get to a, um, an optical viewfinder. And that's not just because of the blackout, not just because of the speed of it, but also because of the brightness. So this is the brightest viewfinder you can buy. Um, it's significantly brighter than um, other previous cameras that Nikon have made. And that brightness is what really helps to get a true to life view through your viewfinder, especially if you're a wildlife photographer or if you shoot in bright, sunny conditions. Um, I've been around and about with the Z9 that I've got, and my Z9 has been set up for me for quite a while now. And every time someone picks it up, like their first comment is, wow, that viewfinder is really bright. And it's like, yes, I apologize for that. Um, but that's because it's set up to how I shoot. So um, you can set the viewfinder up to be incredibly bright and incredibly well detailed. Um, and a lot of people have commented how it does look um, like a true um, optical viewfinder. Now, one of the things that um, we always get asked about is, you know, what can this autofocus system track? So just to be clear, um, we can track certain sections of people. So it's not just eyes and faces, it's eyes, heads, faces, upper bodies. Um, these can be tracked on their side, upside down. There's so much. This not just a case of, oh, it's looking for eyes. It's also tracking that entire person, that entire body of that person as well. Um, and we can do the same thing for animals. So we can track an animal from a whole body, eyes, heads. Um, and again, it's not just cats, dogs, and birds. I've been out and tested it with a number of different animals. Um, there's not really many that I've been able to find that it won't track. So generally, if you, especially if you're into wildlife photography, especially if you're into birds, um, pretty much everything in terms of the animal kingdom is what it will track. There are some exceptions that I've found so far, but nothing too major. And then from a vehicle's point of view, what does vehicles mean? Well, that would include things like cars, motorbikes, planes, and trains. So um, if you're in a situation where you're pointing that at a particular subject, if it is a vehicle or if it's a person or if it's an animal, you can determine or, or you can choose which one of those you would want it to track. So you do have what's called an auto tracking mode. And you can basically say that the camera will detect people, animals, and vehicles at the same time. And it will choose which one is either closer to the camera or which one it thinks is the one that it wants to focus on in the frame, generally the one that's most dominant. Or if you're a vehicle photographer, if you want to shoot cars, but you don't want the camera to automatically focus on a person or anything like that, or there might be people walking around those vehicles and you don't want the camera to jump to that person, you can ask the Z9 to only specifically look for either people, animals or vehicles. So you do have the ability to add in choice about how it's looking at those subjects as well. So that's generally covers like one of the biggest questions we always get is how is that auto focusing system looking for different people? So hopefully that gives you a bit of insight into how it's working. And I am seeing that we're getting some really good questions in as well. So um, one of the questions I just read quickly was to Mark, which is, hi, I just want to confirm the original FTZ fits on the Z9. Yes, really good question. So there is an FTZ2, and I've got a picture of it somewhere, if I can find it. Um, so the FTZ2, is designed specifically to have the removal of the kind of tripod mount. There was lots of comments online and people were a bit confused about whether, whether or not there'd be any difference other than just that removal of the tripod mount. And there isn't, it's the same FTZ. It's just an FTZ2 without that tripod mount. So it's been redesigned and it fits much nicer with the Z9 grip. Now, in terms of FTZ1, yes, it fits. Yes, it works. The performance is the same. The only downside is that because of that tripod mount on the bottom of the FTZ, the vertical grip on a Z9 is going to be quite tight. So much so that I, I, I can't actually get my fingers through the FTZ grip. So that's where the FTZ2 comes in. So if you have, or if you're looking to get a Z9, if you already have an FTZ1, that will work perfectly fine. You just need to be very careful about 
what grip you're using because if you're using just the standard grip it's going to work fine but if you go to that vertical grip the ftz1 might get in your way if that's the case then you would maybe want to consider looking at getting an ftz2 um did they test angelbird cf express cards yet and how are they and are they, are they reliable um so angelbird cf express cards um they do work they're in probably the most reliable cards um angelbird put incredible amounts of testing and reliability into their cards um the they do work they work fantastically well they are um looking at um, a card specifically for Z9, so to be able to deal with Z9 speed. So um, I don't know if they're looking at an update or if they're updating particular cards to make them work faster with Z9, but they are definitely doing um, something around the compatibility with Z9. Um, Angelbird themselves do have access to a Z9, so they have been testing them cards themselves, and I would say they'd be incredibly good as well. Rishi, do we want to talk yeah. about cards now, given we're, we're, yeah. we're talking about Angelbird there? Because cards are really, if you want to get the best performance out of this camera, your choice of memory cards are very, very important. So I think one thing to keep in mind is that um, the Z9 itself, first of all, it's dual cards. Um, and you can use CF Express cards or you can use XQD. It's entirely up to you, right? You don't have to use just CF Express cards. You can still make use of XQD cards. Um, you can use those cards for video, for stills, whatever you want. But as Neil mentioned, it's really important to make sure that you have the right card for what you're trying to do. If you're a landscape photographer or a product photographer and you're taking like one shot and you're not using the Z9 at 20 frames per second, then an XQD card is fine, right? It's gonna work perfectly fine. You're gonna get great reliability, great performance. But if you're in a situation where you do want to use the Z9 for things like wildlife and sports and you are literally using it at its maximum potential, then you are probably going to need to use a CF Express card. Now, unfortunately, not all CF Express cards are equal. They have different speeds. What's really important is you need to make sure that you have what's called their um, sustained write speed or a fast enough sustained write speed. There's only a couple of manufacturers that we found that have been able to um, keep up with that. Um, currently, they are Delkin. So Delkin do a range of black cards. Um, also Prograde Cobalt cards. There's also um, Angelbird as well. Um, there's generally a couple of other brands um, that you could look at that'll be able to deal with that speed as well. There's a couple of tests that people have done um, on different branded cards as well. But generally for us, um, we'll be using either Delkin cards, um, Angelbird cards, or Prograde Cobalt cards as well. So hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, other question was, I have all the F lenses. Will the adapter work well? So this is something that um, I keep seeing coming up. Like those of you who asked this same question about, um, I've got existing F mount lenses and, I, and will they work well or is there any loss of performance on a Z9? Um, and I can understand where that comes from because there are um, a lot of other cameras that shoot really fast, but actually they can't shoot at their fastest if you're not using the right lens. Um, but the numbers that Nikon have quoted in terms of 20 frames per second, 120 frames per second, um, they are achievable with um, F mount lenses. So you don't have to just use Z mount lenses on if, if you don't want to. Um, and in fact, with my time with the Z9, um, my most used lenses on my Z9 were F mount lenses. I've used a 500 millimeter F5.6 PF. I've used a 600 millimeter F4. Um, I used the 120 to 300 2.8. Um, they were all F mount lenses and they worked fantastically well. And they were through the FTZ1 as well. Um, they work fantastically well from a performance point of view. I've not seen any noticeable differences in terms of autofocus. I would say that they are performing as well as they would if they were on a d6 for example so there's not anything that i've been concerned about um i saw there was another question as well um does it slow down autofocus at all and um, if that was in relation to the ftz then the answer is no um how does the grain compare to a z72 in the dynamic range really good question so um, this is a question that's obviously quite important picture quality and, and noise performance are obviously really personal things first of all so do keep in mind what I deem as good noise performance or what I deem as good picture quality might not be the same as what you would deem as good picture quality. Everyone has their own personal preference, right? But um, from what I've seen, um, the noise performance is better than a Z7 II. Um, so that would mean that I, would, I can clearly see that the grain is different. There is less grain and less noise compared to a Z7 II. Um, and the dynamic range 
look slightly different, but generally there is the, the dynamic range is the same or equal to a Z72. You also have to look at what their ISO is as well. So both of them have an ISO of 64 to 25,000. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that currently all, all, all of the cameras out there right now, no matter who has them, are all pre-production. Um, they don't have um, final RAW formats and stuff. And also Lightroom doesn't have um, any kind of final RAW um, transfers of those raw formats either so you have to be a, a really aware of kind of the stuff that's out there is pre-production it's not what it's going to look like from terms of the final camera or might not look like what Lightroom's interpretation of that final raw file is so things will absolutely change until the final um, Z9 actually starts shipping um, Lightroom and Capture One and all the other software companies then kind of get everything together and sorted correctly but from what I'm seeing um, dynamic range is um, the same and then noise performance is slightly increased. Um, good question I saw here was, is the focus peaking of the Z9 different from the focus peaking on the Z72? Is it better? Okay, so the options are um, the same. So if you've got a Z72 already, you have the same options in terms of the level of focus peaking that you can choose. Um, but it does appear that it will give you a lot more focus peaking highlight on the screen itself. Um, I have used it a little bit with the Z mount macro lenses, and it does definitely appear that you're in a situation where you get a lot more kickback of um, focus peaking highlight, more so than you would do on a Z7 II. Um, but I have to kind of keep in mind that a Z9 is designed to be used in autofocus, not in manual focus, if that makes sense. So it does obviously come down to what you want to use it for. Um, are ProGrade any good? Um, I, you know, I can't really comment on ProGrade, unfortunately. I've only. Um, um, I've only I've only been told about ProGrade cards, if that makes sense. Um, in the UK, we haven't had ProGrade cards in hand, so I can't comment on their performance, reliability, and that type of stuff. Um, I do have Dell King cards in hand. I've been using them for a number of months, and I've been very happy with how they performed. Um, I've recently got some new AngelBird cards that AngelBird sent through as well. I've been incredibly happy with how they performed as well. Um, but I, yeah, I can't just comment on ProGrade. Um, as far as I'm aware, none of the Nikon guys in the UK have ProGrade cards. So we're talking um, about capacities there as well yeah. for 8K footage, uh, just sort yeah. of how much capacity this actually uses. It was, it is actually, it might, could be a little bit of a shock actually, um, especially if, well, if we go, if we go back to kind of um, Z6s and Z7s, generally we talk about how it can be good to have smaller capacity, but then a number of cards, right? Because if you lose one card, you don't lose loads of images and so on. Um, but smaller capacity cards are, are quite difficult to use, especially when it comes to video um, on the Z9, especially if this is the first time that you're recording in 8K. You do have to be aware of how much storage space you're going to use. Um, so for the first time, I'm using um, much larger capacity cards than I ever have them before. Um, to give you an idea, in my Z7 and my Z7 II, I would genuinely use 64 gig and 128 gig would be my biggest card really and they would just be xqd cards um whereas in uh, my z9 my average card size is 512 gigabytes and my largest is two terabytes so the the actual size of card especially if you're wanting to use your z9 over an extended period of time um would need to be larger if you're shooting video that being said the if you're using your z9 for stills the still raw files are smaller than um, the raw files that you would get out of a z72 so one of the things that um, is always worth talking about is this new high efficiency raw format so what is this and what does it do well if you are a nikon user if you've used nikon in the past um, nikon created what was called raw small and this raw small file format was really useful for any of you who have shot D850 um, or anything that was kind of high megapixel count and you wanted a smaller file size. You could shoot in a smaller file size and it would take up less storage space, but a raw small was always a 12-bit raw file and it also sacrificed megapixel count. You had to generally um, drop the megapixel count down. So... Um, that is completely gone. You, you, in the Z9, there is no option of raw small. There is no option of a large raw or anything like that. All you have now are essentially compression types. So you have lossless compressed. You have high efficiency raw um, with a star. 
or a little asterisk, depending on what you want to call it. And that's generally the higher quality. And then you just have high efficiency raw without the star. And those three options are your options of image quality. They are your options of raw file size as well. So if you want to shoot the best quality, you would still choose lossless compressed. If you wanted to shoot uh, almost identical, and I'm still struggling to see any differences here, um, you would choose um, high efficiency star, but that file size is a lot smaller and it's still 14 bit. And you don't, you're not in a situation where you have to then all of a sudden lose quality by going down to 12 bit, for example. Um, and then if you're not, if you, if you're not too concerned about losing a tiny bit of quality, but you still want the kind of the, the smallest file size you can get, you would then shoot high efficiency raw without the star. Um, and that would be the one third of a standard raw file size. So you can get some incredible um, number of images on one card without having to worry about all of those extra um, file sizes, if that makes sense. So the file size in general is smaller, even if you're shooting lossless compressed, and then the high efficiency even makes that file size even smaller. So from an imaging point of view, from stills photography, your files are smaller, but from a video point of view, hence this is the first time we can shoot in 8K, um, the file sizes are obviously gonna be larger than if you were shooting in 4K. Um, just have a quick look at any other questions. Um, does it have live view and focus stacking? Um, well, I'm gonna, if I interpret that question correctly, when you say live view, I mean, the whole camera is live view um, because obviously we're working through an EVF and we're working through the rear screen. So everything on a Z9 is live view. Um, when you say focus stacking, it does have focus stacking. Nikon call that focus shift shooting. So when it comes to focus shift shooting, you're in a situation where you would set the menu up and you would tell the camera how many pictures you want it to take. And you would also then tell the camera what would be the distance between each picture it takes. Obviously, that would be different for macro photography versus landscape photography. And it will then go and shoot those images for you. But it does not do in camera stacking. So you're still in a situation where you'd want to um, stack those images in post-processing. So I wanna be really clear there that technically it does have an in-camera focus stacking option called focus shift shooting, but it does not stack those images together in camera. It helps you to shoot them and then you would then stack them with post-processing later as well. Um, question from Ronald, um, what video formats will the Z9 record in 8K upon first release? Um, standard, N-Log, ProRes, and the same question for 4K video. Okay, so um, for 8K, you'll be able to record um, standard, obviously. You can record 8-bit, 10-bit. You can record in 8K, 10-bit, N-Log um, with um, HLG, or you can just do a standard um, picture control as well. Um, 8K ProRes is what is going to be firmware updated. So just be aware that if you do want to do ProRes um, 8K, that will be available at a later date. Um, but that's going to be a firmware update that's required for that, first of all. Um, you, from release, you can do 4K ProRes. So you can do 4K 60 at ProRes in the camera. Um, but if you want to do any higher than that, then again, you, the firmware update that's coming early next year is what you would need. Just to be clear, if you're not aware, that firmware update is free. So if you have a Z9 and you are going to be using it for, for video, there's a lot that's going to be added on um, in an early firmware update next year um, that will be free for Z9 users as well. But you can use um, N-Log or ProRes internally. Um, you don't have to record anything externally. You can use HLG internally as well. In fact, the Z9 is actually fundamentally designed to be used internally, recording internally. You can record externally if you wanted to, but it's generally designed to be used for internal recording. We've got a lot um, of great questions keep coming in here um, yeah. as well there. Pierre, can we talk about the design of the new virtual horizon? That is really, really good. The whole viewfinder is customizable. Um, and whenever we show the uh, demo one we've, uh, demo Z9 we've got, we have to make that caveat because there are so many ways you can customize the display. You've currently got the virtual horizon set permanently on yours, haven't you, Rishi? Yeah, so um, like Neil mentioned, you have a choice of customizing your entire display. So it's not like um, if you've got a Z62 or a Z72 or just a Z6 or Z7, you're in a situation where you can choose different displays, 
But on the Z9, you can remove and add extra bits in and out. So it's not like you have to go and choose a different display because one of the things that people like to do is they might want two different things on their display. So let's say, for example, on a Z6, you wanted to have the virtual horizon and the histogram at the same time. You can't do that. But on a Z9, you can. You can choose to have a magnitude of different things and you can set that display up to make it fit what your requirements are. So um, I have my virtual horizon on all the time. I use it not only for landscape, but I also use it for my wildlife photography. Um, so it makes sense for me to have that on. But if that's not something you would use, then you can change that. Um, you can actually change the type of virtual horizon as well. So the one that I have on my camera that goes all the way across the screen, there is a different type of virtual horizon if you didn't like the look of that one. So it's entirely up to you. Um, We're going to have different answers to this. Okay, okay. I'll answer it first. Not sure if, <laughs> if to get a 500 PF or the new 100 to 400. Um, was planning on going to Namibia in May, um, but may have just jinxed the trip. Yes. So, um, well, um, it's a tough one. For, for me, I would, I would probably go 500 PF just because I love that lens to death. Um, I know what Neil was going to say, but um, <laughs> for me, I, I would probably, it's, it's, well, the fact that I'm hesitant proves how much of a difficult decision it is. The 100 to 400 is probably sharper than the 500 PF when cropped. But I, the, I just, I just, I really like the 500. So yeah, for me, it's probably the 500. So for me, I've just replaced the, I was, I'm a casual wildlife photographer. Um, I do landscapes and portraits. They're my main thing. And then wildlife is, is something I do. I've had in my bag a 70 to 200 Z series with a two times teleconverter on it. Give me 140 to 400 at F 5.6. I am going to use, I'm going to replace that with the 100 to 400 because lengthwise it's pretty much the same size. It's slightly bulkier, but I've not had to change the, area in my back my camera backpack that i keep it in i was thinking we're gonna have to buy a new camera backpack there's nothing wrong with that i love collecting camera backpacks um but i'm going for the 100 to 400 because what i've been doing with playing with it and we had out in some horrendous weather in scotland as well the weather ceiling is incredible on it um i will be using this i tried it with a two times telly which gives me a 200 to 400 uh, 200 to 800 but f11 at the long end wasn't quite keen on that so i think i'm going to settle with this lens 100 400 and if i need to i'll be using the 1.4 teleconverter on it which will give me a 560 f8 at, uh yeah 560 mil at f8 if i need that extra reach so that's the route i'm going down because i've been really really impressed with this lens um the next question was the z9 has no mechanical shutter how does the camera handle banding from led lights my current current mirrorless camera has to be changed over from sensor shutter to mechanical shutter to deal with banding really good question i appreciate that this is a, a big concern for a lot of people um the z9 has been used by a number of photographers who shoot with led lights and also who shoot with flash um we were shooting a lot of flash over the past couple of days with with joe mcnally um so Oh, the, the key thing to keep in mind is that previous um, mirrorless cameras, um, first of all, if you're using flash, you can't shoot silent anyway. And then if you were shooting silently with lights that flicker, it's all based on readout speed. So it's all based on how quickly that camera can read out of the sensor. So generally, um, previous mirrorless cameras have had slower um, read out on their sensors, which basically means when you're using lights to stop banding, you have to rely on a mechanical shutter. Nikon are in a situation where they genuinely feel like the readout speed on the Z9 is so fast that they can replicate the same readout speed as a mechanical shutter. So um, we've not seen um, any situations where we've been shooting with flash um, or with LED panels. Um, I use a lot of Rotolite LEDs um, where I've not seen any issues with any banding or anything like that because of how fast that readout is from the sensor. So that's the key setting if that makes sense if that's the right term to use that that stops that from happening now i'm absolutely positive that there are going to be some situations where if you've got a really bad light or if you're using the incorrect shutter speed that you could start to see um banding but you can still see banding with mechanical shutters so it, there is going to be a point where it might happen but it's definitely not something that i've seen over the past what are we now five six months i think um and we're into you know 
50 60 000 shots so yeah it's not something i've seen because of how fast that sensor can read out but i appreciate other cameras it is a problem for uh steven that's a really good question we much prefer the u1 or certainly i do uh the u1 u2 um layout on the sort of z6 z7 uh bodies i use much prefer that to using the uh menu banks uh it's more intuitive when i need to actually use that um i don't think we'll see that on the z9 because there's no facility really to um build that in um maybe in future we, we just don't know what's coming downstream but i don't see that uh being released on this uh, iteration of the camera um well, it, just to add to that, like you say, it has their menu, it has menu banks instead, doesn't it? And yeah, we um, just the way that we shoot, we prefer the layout of kind of U1, U2 or U3. But there's a lot of people who um, who we speak to who are D5 and D6 users who do like the idea of using menu banks. So I think it just comes down to your personal preference. Um, what's your favorite? Well, this is a really good question, actually. What's your favorite feature of the Z9 for photo, not for video? And what gets you most excited about upgrading? I'll answer this. And then I'll let you answer it. I'm um, allowed only one. Can we go to three? Let's go. Three. <laughs> I'm going to give you, well, the, the biggest the biggest one for me was bird autofocus because you know how long I spent you in Kingfishers. And um, yeah, that for me has allowed me to take pictures that I just wasn't able to take on any, any camera before. Um, I just couldn't get shots, anything like I've been able to on my Z9. I couldn't get them on a D850. I couldn't get them on a D5, D6. It's just harder to get. I could maybe get them if I really tried, if my technique was down, but the, the Z9 just kind of makes that easier. So for me, that number one feature is bird autofocus for me, really. I'm going to have to go with, so I'm primarily a landscape photographer, so I'm going to have to go with the tilt screen that now tilts vertically when I've got the camera on a tripod and it auto rotates the image. That's number one. That's probably my biggest because that, Saves my back. I'm getting older here. And um, yeah, it just saves my back and bending over at really odd angles to see vertical um, uh, shots when I'm shooting in sort of uh, uh, portrait mode for my landscapes. Um, I'm going to chuck in a couple of other ones. I do astrophotography. So the red mode view, uh, terrific. Don't lose my night vision on there as well. And the one thing that I felt was missing from the Z7 II, light up buttons. Um, these are small things. These, though, help me as a photographer when I'm shooting my landscapes. I'm often out at dawn, dusk, sunrise, sunset, astrophotography. They just make my life easier as a photographer. I thought that was a really good question. So thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, it was. Um, Mark asked, if you shoot silent, is there an indication in the viewfinder that you're shooting? Um, it's your choice. Um, there's a couple of different choices. So if you really wanted to, you can turn blackout back on. So if he wanted that indication of almost like the shutter closing down, even though there isn't one, um, then you can turn that back on. You can have um, lines on the left and the right hand side of the viewfinder and they will flick on the left and right hand side. They'll flicker at you when you're shooting and you can have lines all the way around your frame. So you can have top, bottom, left and right firing at you when you're shooting or you can just turn all of that off. So then when you're firing, nothing happens, if that makes sense. And surprisingly, that's generally the way that I prefer to have my camera set up. Um, it might sound strange because a lot of other photographers have their the lines flickering at them, but um, generally I, I just have all of that turned off and I'm, I'm basically expecting the camera to fire when I tell it to fire. Um, next question was, what can you tell us about the GPS on the Z9? Do I have the little case shot here? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so one of the questions I got previously is, um, where's the GPS located? So there is a small cutout up here that's built into basically the top of the Z9 viewfinder. Um, and that's where the GPS unit will sit. And on the actual Z9 itself, you'll see there's like a little um, cover that fits that as well. It's obviously not removable, but that's generally where it would sit. Um, this is a full wide worldwide GPS system. Um, I've not used it um, for GPS. I've just not been using the GPS on it at all. I've never really geotagged um, images, but I do know a lot of wildlife photographers and a lot of photographers who enter competitions. It's getting more and more important to get the GPS location in your images. So I am thankful that the GPS is in there because it was a very big requested subject. And it obviously means you don't have to use an external device to um, get that GPS location data. Um, I did a very short test to see how quickly it would acquire. And I was impressed. 
um, based on um, previous cameras that I've looked at in terms of their GPS, it, it actually acquires the GPS signal very quickly compared to other cameras I've tried. Um, Pierre asked, is it possible to move the focusing point with a touchscreen whilst you are viewing the viewfinder? No. Um, I know where that comes from because our D5600 can do that. Um, you can actually assign it as a touch function option, but um, on the Z9, there's not an option that I've found that can do that because when you're looking through the viewfinder, the screen is genuinely deactivated. Obviously, if you're looking at the screen, then you can use the touch screen to move the focusing point around, but you can't do that when you're looking through the viewfinder. Um, with the high speed, high sensor speed, what is the flash sync speed of a Z9? So you've got, you've got a couple of different options. Um, if you just wanted to shoot um, at 200th of a second, it'll flash sync at 200th of a second, perfectly fine. Um, if you wanted to shoot at 250th of a second flash sync speed, you would have to go and change that in the menu. So it's not set to 250th by default. So in the menu, you can go and choose 250th of a second as a flash sync speed. And as long as you do that, you can then get a flash sync speed of 250th of a second. Any higher, you would need to um, enable what Nikon call auto FP, um, and that's Nikon's version of high speed sync. So if you wanted to shoot at 400, 800, 1000, 2000, 8000th of a second, as long as you've chosen the mode in the menu that has auto FP next to it in brackets, you can then make use of high speed sync. Hopefully that answers that. Um, A question about did, buying new computers yeah. there. Oh, is, is it easy to edit 8K and 4K <laughs> RAW files on a MacBook? Um, if we're talking about RAW files, um, the you have to be aware that I've not had access to 8K RAW and 4K um, RAW video files yet. Um, the, the 8K RAW will become available in February. Um, what I have been able to edit, though, is the 10-bit 8K files, um, and that's been fine on a newer computer. Um, I'm probably not the best person to answer that because I've literally just bought a brand new MacBook Pro that absolutely destroys 8K video, and it's amazing for that. Um, and it's really good at dealing with ProRes as well. So I've not had any issues on a brand new MacBook Pro, but I appreciate that on older computers, you are going to have concerns. Um, I've edited 10-bit um, 4K stuff on even on older machines, so um, like a 2017 iMac or a 2017 MacBook Pro. Um, 4K has been fine on those, but if you're looking at 8K, I would suspect you would want something that was within the last 12 months, personally. Uh, for the next question, we've seen there with a portraiture mode on it. Everything that's out there at the moment, anybody that's tested a camera has a pre-production module, uh, a model camera. So nothing is final, final firmware. Nothing is final uh, production. Um, we've not seen any issues at all with the models that we've got. Uh, we've seen a few as well, but everything that's out there at the moment is pre-production. So um, it, nobody can really draw any conclusions uh, at the moment because everything's not final firmware and it's not, uh, it's not final product. Um, Andy's question was, I have a camera, my camera set up for back button focus as I mainly shoot wildlife. Will this still work when using 3D tracking? Yeah, um, the first thing I did on my Z9, I didn't change anything else. The very first thing I did uh, um, was go and take autofocus off of my shutter button. Um, that and, and I, basically I always use then the AF on button as my um, autofocus activation. So that perfectly worked that per worked perfectly in 3D tracking. And if anything, it actually works better in 3D tracking because the, the way that the 3D tracking works is that you'll have a selectable box in the middle of the frame. And then as there is a subject that is detectable, like an eye or a face, that box will not automatically jump to that subject until you activate autofocus. So that would then become much easier by you pressing the AF on button rather than you half pressing the shutter button and accidentally taking a shot when you didn't mean to. So um, yes, I would absolutely continue to use back button focus in 3D tracking. And in, in, in actual fact, it will make 3D tracking um, a lot more usable as well, rather than relying on focus from your shutter button. Um, do you normally use an icon? 
cool. add on for large um, add on a larger add on sorry um, and is it useful on a Z9 based on the brightness of the EVF and glare I personally don't um, I have spoke to a number of photographers who um, use those larger eyepieces that cover the side of their glasses because um, sometimes they get light spill in from the side of their glasses and um, that's unfortunately just not something I've never used um, I've always generally been happy with um, autofocus oh not with autofocus I've generally always been happy with EVFs um, the key thing for me is that the brightness is what makes it so much easier so one thing that might be useful to know is that when I shoot wildlife I shoot with both eyes so my right eye I'm a right eye shooter so I look through the viewfinder with my right eye and my left eye looks down the barrel of my lens and previously it was always a bit difficult because my left eye was looking at daylight which was often much brighter and my right eye was looking through a viewfinder um, that was often a little bit darker and that can sometimes, you know, if you're not used to that, that can sometimes be a little bit distracting. But in some situations, especially if it's cloudy, my viewfinder is brighter than daylight. Um, and on really bright days, uh, my viewfinder is just as bright as daylight outside. Um, also, if you are out and about on really bright situations and you want to shoot through sunglasses, you don't have to worry about taking your sunglasses on or off anymore purely because of how bright that viewfinder is as well. So I've not had any concerns with kind of glare from sunlight. If anything, um, it's been the other way around because there's been a couple of situations where I've left my viewfinder at its maximum brightness and then used my camera at night and literally blinded myself because of how bright it is. So um, I would probably say that it's, as long as you look after the brightness of your viewfinder, um, you should get some really good results and you should be happy with it as well. Yeah, I'd second that as well. You, I know we're talking about this brightness as a viewfinder, but this has to be seen and, and then customised to be believed. It is really, really, really good. Uh, even I pick this camera up and I go back to my Z7 II, um, which I really like, but the, the Z9 puts this EVF brightness into a whole new ballpark. Um, and, obviously, you know, one of the things about EVFs as well, it's not just about brightness, resolution and so on. It's also about the glass that's in front of that EVF, um, which makes it look more lifelike and makes it look sharper in the corners and gives you a better, a better color rendition as well. So the glass in front of that EVF is incredibly important to make sure that you're seeing what you should be seeing. Um, and Nikon are, are quite um, vocal about the fact that the EVF will give you a genuine, continuous, real-time view. There is nothing that you can do to stop that view from not being a real live view, if that makes sense. There's a couple of settings where you could turn it off if you really wanted to, um, but just things like focusing or shooting um, in some other cameras that will either give you a blackout or it might give you a drop in frames and you can then, you might miss the subject as they're moving. So that is not something that happens and it generally allows you to, to really follow, especially fast moving subjects, especially birds in flight and stuff like that as well. Um, I'll answer this next question and I'll also then let you answer this next question because it's about dust. So um, the, the question is, do you notice less dust due to the new sensor cover? Um, that's a hard one for me to, to answer because I don't really get a lot of um, dust on my cameras anyway. I don't know why. I just, I just don't. I don't really need to clean my cameras all that often. Um, Quite famously, Neil, on the other hand, though, uh, <laughs> does attract loads of dust. So I think for him, it's an absolute game changer. Um, for me, it's a nice add-on. Yeah, I, I will have to add. I, I, and this is not just a mirrorless thing for me. I don't know what I do. I seem to attract dust. We yeah. can be standing side by side at the same location, and my 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 sensor will end up with all the dust. So I think I just stop it hitting Rishi's camera. Um, so this is gonna. And that was my DSLR, be my 850, 810 before that. Z7, Z7 II. Um, this is will be a game changer for me because I'll have to clean my sensor a lot less. So uh, looking forward to using that. Um, did you have any subjects with the autofocus when you were photographer subject against the sun? No, I have a whole um, I have a whole collection. I don't know how many images it is in total. It must be about 100 to 200 images of um, seagulls fly, basically taking off and then flying through the sky backlit by sunrise um that that for me was um really impressive because obviously i have seen in the past that um other cameras can sometimes lose their subject if it's a very strongly backlit subject um but i've got some incredible images of birds in flight backlit from the sun i mean it was low in the sky it was a low sunrise as well so quite bright 
um, but still you know, enough of a, a distraction that could have caused the camera problem, but it didn't. It kept that subject in focus as they, they were flying right past the sun, basically. Um, and then obviously up to when they flew off into the distance. So no, I've not noticed any issues with um, a subject against sunlight. It's been perfectly fine. Um, will diopters be available when the camera is released? I don't know if they'll be available when the camera is released, but the viewfinder will have or will take attachments. Um, I don't know if I've got a better screen to show you than this one. I might not, but this um, rubber ring here is removable. Um, in previous cameras, like a D850, it was a screw ring, whereas this is on a little button. So you push this little button in and this ring will then detach and it then clicks back on. So there, I'd imagine there will be lots of viewfinder accessories and attachments, especially like extended diopters and so on. Um, but I'm not sure that they'll be available at launch because I've not seen anything about them already. So um, unless I've missed it, I'm unsure on that one. But they, I would imagine that they'll be available at some point in the future. Um, right. We are 45 minutes in. <laughs> um, so I think I've covered chat about most... lenses. Yes. Uh, let's have a look. Let's, I was going to say, I think we've covered most things that we wanted to talk about on Z9. Um, two lenses that are probably worth talking about. We mentioned earlier about the 100 to 400. Um, both myself and Neil have, have spent some time with this. Um, it, this is also one of the lenses that's important to keep in mind if you're a Z9 user because it allows you to use what's called synchro VR. So the Z9 with certain lenses, which is the 100 to 400, the um, 70 to 200, and the 105 macro can make use of this synchro VR, which would increase the number of stops of the VR of the lens. So you'll get 5.5 stops of VR with the lens on its own. Um, and then when you put that on a Z9, that increases that because it uses the in-body stabilization and the lens VR better. Um, as Neil mentioned earlier, the 100 to 400 is also TC compatible with the 1.4 times and the two times. Um, Neil, this is a, I think this is a lens that you're really keen on um and i the, the only real problem for me is that um, i think it might just be a little bit too short for the wildlife that i shoot a lot of small birds is generally what i shoot so i might want something that's like 600. yeah i really like this lens it's uh weather sealing is terrific as i said we had it out in scotland a couple of weeks ago and got caught in a couple of storms and yeah it was we always end up with um sort of uh weather weather sealing tests whether we um want to do them or not and yeah, just incredible. What I really like about it is I have the buttons program to uh, autofocus as well. The balance of the lens, the lens has been designed. So when you extend the barrel, it doesn't shift the weight forward. So as soon as you zoom from 100 to 400, the balance doesn't change on the lens. It is really easy to shoot handheld. Uh, you've got, as I said on there, you've got the fluorine coating as well, which helps with the weather sealing as well. But the balance of this lens is, is something a bit different. And it's much, I find it much easier to use than say my 70 to 100 uh, with a two times teleconverter on it. It's much more balanced. And the size, you'll be very surprised about the size of this. Um, as I said, goes in my existing space here in my uh, camera bag that's taken up by my 7200Z and it just fits in there. It is re a really, really terrific lens uh, with all the sort of usual features you'd expect from an S-line uh, Nikol lens. Um, there was a question about the um, bokeh of the 100 to 400. Um, I always um, struggle to answer those questions because I think it's massively subjective. What looks good to me might not look good to you, but I was actually, I thought it was really good. It's clean. There's no distracting artifacts. Um, and I thought I was, I thought it was really nice. Yeah, it is really good. We were shooting it um, yesterday, um, doing some portraiture. I was actually doing some portraiture with it yesterday um, and just throwing some trees out of focus, had a bit of sunlight coming through it. And again, for me, very nice back uh, backlit bouquet uh, coming through the, the trees there. But as Rishi said, um, a bit subjective as to whether you like it or not. Um, and there's also the 24 to 120. So, you use this more than I have. Yeah, so we've been able to use this um, over the um, past few days, um, especially from a portraiture point of view as well. Um, this 24 to 120 is a really interesting lens, mainly because, um, well, if you're a portrait photographer, you don't need me to tell you what lens you want to use. But um, there's a couple of considerations as to why this might be a go to lens for a lot of portrait photographers. The first one, obviously, being the versatility. So being able to zoom from 24 to that extra reach of 120 just gives you a lot more versatility than you would get from a 70, not from a 70, sorry, a 24 to 70 millimeter. And um, 
I've been comparing this a lot against the 24 to 72.8. Even though it's an F4, it's still giving you incredibly good quality. And I'm struggling to see a difference between the F4 and the F2.8. So um, it's going to be really interesting to see if photographers prefer the longer focal length of the 120 versus um, being in a situation where you go for like a 24 to 72.8. So the 2.8 is going to give you that brighter aperture, but the 24 to 120 might give you a little bit more compression, a little bit longer focal length, and still generally being a similar size and a, a well, it's actually a tiny bit smaller and obviously being an F4. So quality of this I've been really impressed with so far. Um, but generally speaking, um, for me, it's, it'd probably be a, a, a lens that I would use more than a 24 to 72.8 if I was concerned about size and weight um, as a main point of use. I just want to add on to that. So back in my career when I was a wedding photographer a long time ago, I used the F-mount version of this over and above the 2470 f2.8 because that extra reach was much more useful at a wedding. This is so much sharper and so much better than the old version, the F-mount version. It's in a different league, as we'd expect, with an S-series, uh, um, Z-series lens. And I'm, I'm pretty certain that I will be, when this is available, taking this um, and removing the 2470 f2.8 out of my bag because this gives me that extra reach, which for landscapes and portraiture is more important to me than actually being able to stop it down to f2.8. That difference between f2.8 and f4 these days, yes, I get a little bit more black ground blur, but I'm going to be shooting it quite a bit at sort of 5.6 f8. If I want real background blur when I'm doing quartrature, I'm going to use a longer lens to compress the background, or I'm going to shoot wide open with, say, like the 50mm 1.2. Um, I see. I've seen that we've had a question from Tom Mason. How, Tom? Good to see you. Um, not, but great you're here. <laughs> yeah, we can't see Good Tom. See yeah. Um, does the 100 to 400 maintain magnification ratio at its closest focusing distance? Um, technically, no, because um, when you zoom the lens in from 100 to 400, its closest focusing distance changes. Um, but if you were able to move to compensate for that, then genuinely you would be at the same distance, if that makes sense. So. Um, your your subject will still look um, the same in the frame, but you obviously have to be further away because the minimum focusing distance isn't isn't the same. But that was one thing was it is actually quite impressive with this lens. It is that minimum focusing? It's actually very close for a lens yeah. of this caliber, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, so if you are you, you know wanting a lens that's a zoom lens to be able to get close to insects and stuff like that, don't get me wrong, it's not quite a macro lens, but it is a very good close close focus zoom lens. Um, Brent asks, does the Z9 custom control assignment support AF area modes plus AF on like the D850 does? Yes, it does. Um, so you can assign a button that has an area mode plus AF on if you wanted to. Um, Pierre asked, does the 24 to 120, um, is it much better optically than the 24 to 200? Um, if they're um, both at their widest open aperture, the 24 to 120 is slightly um, sharper if you're using them at both at like 120. Um, I think the the downside to the 24 to 200 really is that it's at, obviously it's at a darker aperture. So you're generally using it at F6.3 rather than at F4. Um, quality wise of the lens, the 24 to 120 is gonna be a sharper lens, but um, you can also shoot it wide open at F4 throughout the entire range. Whereas the 24 to 120 is a variable, not sorry, the 24 to 200 is a variable aperture. And that would probably be more of a concern or of a thing to be aware of over the constant aperture of a 24 to 120 personally. It's also going to have, being an S-line lens, the 24 120 will have better weather sealing on it as well. Yeah. Um, cool. I think. That is most things that I wanted to cover from here. So if there's any final questions, then please do let us know. But you've asked some amazing questions. Um, hopefully the answers we've given you have sufficed. Um, but if there's any other final questions, then please do let us know. Cool. Cool. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Uh, it's, we really appreciate your spending your evening with us. Uh, if you're in the UK or wherever you are, really, really do appreciate um, you joining us here. Um, and all that's left for us to say here is enjoy the rest of your weekend and uh, have a good evening. Stay safe, everybody. Thanks. Bye.